Hey, what's going on traders? It's Chris at Virilo Trading. Hope you guys are having a good day today. Um, so this is gonna be another video where we give updates about an automated trading system that we are developing using Axel, uh, automated custom study language, which is a form of C++ using the software Sierra Chart. So that's what we're going to show in this video is basically some progress we've made to an automated trading system. Now, what's really interesting here is that, well, first guys, on this channel, we do normally platform tutorials. So if you are looking for tutorials about interactive broker software or other types of uh, trading software, then definitely check out those other videos because there's a lot of very high quality tutorials. Now, in this video, this is a new style of content that we're trying, which is basically we're posting updates about progress related to an automated trading system. Now, what's really interesting about this is that I have a background in discretionary trading. I've traded discretionary in the same way for quite a long time. And now I'm at the point where I'm working to create an automated trading system that is based upon rules that I've developed as a discretionary trader. So I'm implementing certain knowledge and certain techniques into a program. So I feel like it's kind of an interesting gray zone, right? So normally people, when they get into algo trading, they either go strictly, you know, quantitative and they don't really may not have a lot of market knowledge. But I think that a person who does have, you know, who can trade, and also starting to go into algo territory, it seems like a bit of a recipe for disaster. So it's definitely something that I find very interesting, but you know, at the end of the day, we don't know what will come out of it. All I can do is share with you guys what I've been up to and the progress that is being made. So first I need to give a quick thank you to one trader who has helped me a lot on my journey in uh, trading so far in regards to coding, which is the trader Frozen Tundra, because if it were not for him, I would not have ever got into this sort of um, creating custom studies and CRR chart and learning how to make automated trading systems. Literally, if it was not for him, I would have never done this probably. So really good. Thanks to him. Go check out his channel, Frozen Tundra Trader. Okay. So last time I left you guys, um, I basically had sort of the bare bones of this. So I had implemented a couple of buy order structures and sell order structures into the program. And really there wasn't a lot going on. Now, what we've done since then is a lot. Okay, so let me kind of try to walk you through what is going on here. So towards the top of the study, we have all our defaults and persistent variables. And this study is requiring us to store a lot of persistent um, integers in memory. And um, this might change, but we're slowly building it out in a way where we're doing what we have to do. And then we'll probably end up optimizing it later. But so far, the performance has been very good. And this study has a very low calculation time. Actually, it's been pretty much close to zero. And it depends upon the number of days that are being loaded on the chart. So the more days being loaded, the higher the calculation time, but I really haven't seen any high calculation times yet with this. So that's pretty good that it's very quick and uh, seems to be optimized by itself already. So here we have the block for the main study, which is basically calculating our subgraphs on the chart. And then after that is being done, um, is where we go on to kind of the uh, the real fire, you know? So some of this is stolen from other code examples and other studies in Sierra Chart, but a lot of uh, what we've implemented here required a lot of thinking and a lot of trial and error. So I'm pretty happy as to where I got with this so far because there were certain things that I really was scratching my head out for a long time and it was just like going crazy basically. So <laughs> I'm pretty happy we got that done because now um, it looks like we're, we're ready to do some serious testing. This button here, what this does right here is that if this button is pressed, it um, this code right here, basically tells it that it's going to be an on off button. Okay, and this, this code right here was taken from another Sierra chart study. Um, also what we are doing with this is there's an input that we've added to our study, which is called the enabled input. And um, what this does when we press this button is it enables that input, it literally turns it on, okay? Um, and when that input is turned on, that's gonna be one of our conditions that is being used to submit orders to the market. And uh, so basically when our button is on, it's constantly checking for the buy order condition. When the button is off, then it is not doing anything, okay? And that actually brings us to the next block right here, which is if input underscore enabled dot get bool is equal to zero, meaning if the input is turned off, then it returns the entire function and nothing happens. It also resets all of the persistent order IDs. Now, actually this was just here. These blocks were just here because we were in a stage of testing things, but actually I'm pretty sure that this can be commented out right now. We don't need to reset the order IDs when we turn off the study. Actually, we are resetting them when we turn it on anyway, so it doesn't matter. But there was a lot of issues I was running into with the next code here. So let's go on with it. So right here, there is some conditions we've implemented for auto order modifications for our parent orders. Because the way this trading strategy works is 
the orders, once they are live in the market, they are automatically modified to specific values. There's also other conditions that we have not implemented yet in regards to how these orders will be canceled under certain circumstances. So um, actually one of the main reasons why I'm sharing this with you guys is to kind of show you what goes behind um, thinking about creating an automated trading system. And also I don't mind sharing it because this is far from complete and there's many conditions that are missing from the study. And so even if somebody were to copy paste my code, they, it is very, very unlikely that they will be able to do anything or understand what I'm trying to do with it if the order ID which is stored into persistent memory is not equal to zero, meaning there is an order ID stored in persistent memory, then it goes ahead and executes this entire block of code right here. And actually there's a one, two, because there's two separate order structures so far that we applied it to. Um, but the point is that we've got it working thus far, so we're gonna use that on our other orders as well. Okay, and then also this is something similar where we check for the order IDs of our attached orders. So if the order IDs of our attached orders are not zero, then it goes ahead and executes these blocks right here, okay? Now, if there are no existing orders, that means that the order IDs are all at zero because as soon as we turn on the study, all the order IDs get reset to zero anyways, okay? So actually what will happen the first time you turn this on is this entire block of code will get skipped and it will go all the way to here. Um, and now this is where I guess it starts to become a little bit interesting. So the first thing we do is in our buy order um, function, which starts right here, um, the first thing that needs to be true is the input needs to be turned on. The input underscore enabled, it needs to be set to true. It needs to be true, it needs to be turned on, okay? The second thing is our position quantity needs to be equal to zero. And actually what quantity is, is not the position quantity. What it actually is, is set to this right here. The position quantity with all working orders of the position data. So this is a member of um, an SC position data structure, I guess. That's kind of how I can explain it. I'm still learning the terminology and all this. But basically, this is what it does. The structure member is needed, so no new orders are submitted when we have working orders. There's basically two things that are stopping the study from constantly placing new orders. The first thing is I've actually set a limit to how many orders there can be at once, and that's set at the top of the study, which is right here, SC dot maximum position allowed, which I set to two currently. That means that this can only trade a maximum of of two contracts. The other condition for our buy order function to go through is that we actually have to have no orders currently working in the marketplace. So if we have two working orders in the marketplace, um, this right here or the quantity integer that we specified will be a non-zero number. If we have two orders working that will increase our position size, then it will be set to two basically. So that means that quantity will not be equal to zero and it will not submit the buy order function. The last condition we implemented right here for this buy order function to be true is the last traded price, which we've specified right here, needs to be greater than or equal to the value of our subgraph plus two ticks. So it needs to be two ticks above the subgraph or higher. And if it is not, meaning that if the last price is below two ticks above this subgraph, then the buy orders will not be submitted, okay? And that is because this right here is a passive buy order structure. It's meant to submit the limit buy orders, okay? And I actually forgot this right here, which is a timer. Um, and this is actually pretty, um, pretty technical here. Um, so yeah, this block of code here was written by Frozen Tundra. And um, what it does, it's basically a timer. And um, the last updated here is what is being used to update the current time and it basically is being used to check if a certain amount of time has passed. So this last updated variable is being stored in persistent memory and um, we select a custom interval. In this case, I set it to five seconds, but um, you can set it to anything you want. And uh, what it's doing here is the first thing is it's storing the current time then it's getting the time in seconds. And I'm also storing this to a persistent integer um, because I'm using this to reset the last updated with other uh, if statements above here when it comes to uh, resetting order IDs. And all the blocks of code up here are not getting executed unless we have existing order IDs. So basically I'll show you how this study works now. When we press the button, when we press this button right here, it will turn on input underscore enabled 
and it will make it a value of one. That is our first condition for the buy orders to be submitted. The second condition means that we need to have no existing orders already in the market that will increase our position size. So if there's no existing orders, it will go through. And the last condition is that the last traded price needs to be two ticks above this subgraph or higher. So that is it. Now what we'll do here is we're going to go into our trading platform. What I'll do now is I'll press the button and um, because the study is already running on our chart, the timer is going, meaning that five seconds have passed probably. So as soon as I press the button, it should submit new orders. But we're gonna show you what happens now when we press the button. So we have our order blocks that are submitted. And now we have existing order IDs that have been saved in persistent memory for every single one of these orders. The first reason why the order IDs need to be stored is for order modification for these orders. So as you can see, the orders move by themselves and that was a good timing right there. Um, so actually, if I also try to drag them and modify them, you can see that they are pegged to those subgraphs. They automatically modify themselves to the subgraph, okay? The attached orders don't, the attached orders are different. Um, now, the next reason why we needed to store all of the order ideas is what I will explain to you right here. So if we go ahead and look at the code now for these blocks right here, which are now getting triggered because our order IDs are not zero no longer. So if buy low order ID is not equal to zero, then it checks for these if statements here. And it's doing this for all of them because all of these order IDs are not zero right now. They've all been assigned to a value. Okay, so now what we have first is an S underscore SC trade order member, which is basically just telling it the name of an existing order. And then this function right here gets the order by its order ID. And we're using the order ID that is stored in persistent memory to specify exactly which order it is, okay? So what this says is that sc.getOrderByOrderID by low order ID. So actually which order, which order this is, is this one right here. It's this, this order right here. Um, is not equal to SC trading underscore order underscore error. What that means is that if the order is not, has not been rejected, then we continue with this. And what happens here is um, this order status code right here, in order to get that, you need to use this function right here, which is get order by order ID. You cannot get the order status code for an order so far from what I've determined, unless you use this function, which is get order by order ID. Okay, there might be another function you can do as well, but um, that's the way we did it. So basically what I told it to do is if the order status code for this particular order is equal to order filled, meaning if the order has been filled, if this order is equal to pending cancel, meaning it's pending cancel, meaning for some reason I pressed cancel or the order was canceled and it didn't get canceled immediately. Um, order has been filled. And the third condition is if this order was canceled. So what happens is the order ID gets reset to zero and the last updated or our timer that is being used to send orders is also being reset. For any time any one of these orders is filled or is canceled, it resets its order ID to zero and it resets our timer. The reason for that is because we do not want to be submitting new orders right after an order has filled. In the case that our position is closed um, and our timer condition is true, there's a chance that right after we get out of a trade or reduce the quantity of our trade, that new orders will be submitted almost immediately. Now that's not what we wanted, especially for closing a position. We want the position to be closed and then the timer to reset itself before submitting brand new orders, okay? So what we needed to do in order to succeed with that is this right here, okay? So it gets the order by its order ID and it checks the order status code if the order has been filled, if the order is a pending cancel, and if the order has been canceled, then it resets the order ID to zero and uh, last updated, which is our time check, is set to the current time in seconds and all that, okay? So what we'll do now is we will get out of this trade, okay? So we've moved one of our stop orders up and we have not implemented the automatic order, order has been filled. bracket order management yet. So that's why the stop didn't work. But what you saw there was as soon as we exited the trade, 
our timer reset itself and it, our timer set to five seconds. So five seconds after our position was closed and all of our other uh, conditions were true, it submitted a new block of buy orders here, okay? Now I'll also just show you if I cancel these orders, our conditions are gonna be true, the timer resets itself and in five seconds it should submit them. So right now, boom, there you go. So that's how this works currently and we need to now, well, this is sort of um, where we're at with this and there's a lot that needs to be done still, but I think that that was the bulk of um, a decent amount of work that needed to be done in regards to uh, the automatic placement of orders. Um, so we don't actually need to place orders manually. And of course, uh, making sure that all works good with the order modification. So, so what we need to do now is um, use what we've built thus far to now submit the sell side functions as well. And we might do a lot of testing. So we're at the stage where we can actually perform um, a decent amount of testing with this um, so far, which is very good. And again, if you watched my last video, I described how we can use the market replay functionality, um, which is really good because you can run a market replay, you know, very fast. So you can use that to test if your algo is performing correctly and you can make fine adjustments from there. So that's kind of how I've been hacking my way through this because if I had to be testing this on a live market, it would take a lot longer than it needed to um, because of course the market is not that fast. But if you can speed up the market times a thousand, uh, you can clearly see if your algo is working properly or not. And if you need to adjust a couple things. One other thing I noticed that I needed to adjust uh, regarding what I have thus far is I actually need to adjust the condition for the... Um, the second order, second buy order modification condition, and what that basically, what I need to tell it to do now is, if the first order has filled, then do not modify the second, okay? Because you know, really, that's kind of unique to the way I want it to work, okay? So that's where we're at with that, guys. There's still a lot of conditions we got to put in and um, slowly work our way towards being uh, balanced between discretionary and algorithmic trading. So thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.